Amen. I'm going to start this evening in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul is concluding his remarks and the letter that he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And in verse 16, he closes with this. He says, Rejoice evermore. Verse 17, Pray without ceasing. Verse 18, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Paul said a lot of things. We'll look at uh, a number of scriptures tonight that he, um, uh, concerning things that he said to the t- churches in the epistles that he wrote to the different churches. But he's making kind of a bullet point summary of how God expects us to live. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. He goes further to say, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. A lot of people want to know what the will of God is. There's a good start right there. And he's identifying that there should be a lifestyle that demonstrates twice as much rejoicing and giving thanks as praying. Now, this goes so far as to turn with me over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. This goes so far as to identify things that Paul, by the Holy Ghost, is telling us that we should give thanks for. Verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Folks, if this is the formula, that's what our prayer life should look like. It should include supplications. That's where we uh, pray according to the rights that we have identified in the Word. It uh, it's, denotes a heartfelt, earnest prayer, the kind of prayer that you don't uh, pray easily or simply, but something that you hold on to for a period of time. Then prayers, this word is the general word for communication with God. It really means more worship than it does anything else. Then he talks about intercessions. Intercession is to make uh, to fill in the gap between God and somebody. So he's talking about praying for the unsaved here. And then he says giving of thanks. The fourth element is giving of thanks be made for all men. Now he defines who the all men are that he's talking about. For kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, folks, when he writes this saying that we should supplicate, pray, slash, worship, intercede, and giving of thanks, he's talking about giving thanks for people that are persecuting the church. The emperors, the Roman emperors at the time that he's writing these letters, these are not the type of people or the uh, activities of these people is not something that you would expect the Holy Ghost to give, uh, instruct us to give thanks toward, but he does. Now, in case somebody would say, I have a hard time giving thanks for our President Trump, let me just say, hold on to that thought. I really don't want to hear that because I had eight years of difficulty with President Obama. But there's something that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It gives us some insight into how to give thanks or one way that we can give thanks. Starting in verse 14, Paul said, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, when thou shalt bless with the spirit... He's got to be talking about in other tongues. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what you say? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Now he's talking here about tongues and interpretation in public settings. But notice the principle is still the same, that when we pray in other tongues, when we speak in other tongues, we're giving thanks. I spent the last eight years of the Obama administration giving thanks in other tongues because there was no way I could let my mind get involved. But it's still something we have a responsibility. Paul said to give thanks for all men. There'll be times when we supplicate. There'll be times where we pray slash worship. There'll be times where we intercede. But we should always give thanks. Now, this is a theme that Paul uh, continues 
or goes back to time and time again. I'm going to look from uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17 now. He said, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, remember, we just saw the will of the Lord identified in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, he's not talking about people uh, being baptized in the Spirit and speaking with other tongues here. He's writing to Spirit-filled believers. So what he's talking about and what he's going to identify next is a Spirit-filled lifestyle. Not just the action of praying in other tongues. Thank God we have the privilege to, to speak and pray in other tongues. But here he's talking about a Spirit-filled lifestyle. Here's what a spirit-filled life should look like, in other words. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in, our, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I want you to notice, and we'll see this over and over again, I want you to notice that a lifestyle of thanks a lifestyle where we give thanks continually is what the Holy Ghost is telling us that we should strive toward. Look with me over to Colossians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 9, he said, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. He's talking about a lifestyle that exhibits thankfulness. Giving thanks as a matter of course in our lives. Now, he's, the prayer that he prays here is that God would strengthen us with might, according to his glorious power, and unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. But that will result, that strengthened with might will result in a life of thanksgiving. Look with me to chapter 3. Verse 16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That sounds a lot like what he just said to the Ephesians. Verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So again, he identified this as a spirit-filled lifestyle in Ephesians 5. He tells them the same thing, virtually the same thing, almost identically, here in Colossians chapter 3, and it results in a lifestyle of giving thanks. Let's look at a couple other places. Look with me now to Philippians chapter 4. Here's a scripture we should all be familiar with. Verse 6, he says, be careful for nothing. That means don't be anxious or don't fret about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want you to notice, folks, that this spirit-filled lifestyle, this instruction from the Holy Ghost, is a stress-free life and a life of thanks and praise. It's a life where we don't have to carry any cares about anything, but thank God we can cast our cares over on Him. And the prayer and supplication that we make is accompanied by thanksgiving. Again, he's talking lifestyle. Look with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of, of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, when the Bible says, in everything, give thanks. Everything is not thankworthy. There are a lot of times that we'll be in difficulties, a lot of times that we'll be in hardships. But we're still supposed to maintain that life of thanksgiving. 
Well, sometimes those giving of thanks will have to be sacrifices of praise because our feelings aren't associated or hooked up with it. There are a lot of times, a lot of situations that if we were going by our feelings or going by the circumstance, there'd be nothing to thank God for. But that's what he calls the sacrifice of praise and he identifies it as thanksgiving. Now I want you to turn back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I used this illustration uh, Sunday night in healing school, I think it was. And ever since then, I haven't been able to get away from it. Now, there are certain landmark events in the Scripture. We know that, the, that Paul said that the Old Testament was given to us as types and shadows or in samples. We would call it examples. But the, the, the times in Scripture that we have, the Old Testament events, even though it might cover a, a wide span of years, they really don't have a, a great number of events for us to work from. And so the events that we do have, these landmark events, like Numbers chapter 13, for example, where the 12 spies go into the promised land and it shows us how they forfeited the blessing of God. These give us, show us principles. These landmark scriptures, landmark events in the Old Testament give us principles that we can learn from and pattern our lives around. This is one of those events. Verse 1, it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. He's the king of Judah. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat saying, there comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in some place which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? And rulest thou not over the kingdoms of the heathen, all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee. Now, folks, I, I, I love this prayer. This is one of the greatest prayers that I've, uh, I'm aware of in the Scripture. And I want you to notice something. The way that Jehoshaphat prays, most of the modern-day church would say he was being arrogant. Most of the modern-day church would identify from these words that the Scripture gives us, that the Holy Ghost preserved for us. They would assign to that a wrong attitude toward God. And, of course, the reason for that is because most of the modern-day church doesn't know how to pray. They think prayer is telling God how weak and sickly and unworthy we are, trying to justify our need for his help. But Jehoshaphat identifies his need and Judah's need for God's help in a much different way and for a much different reason. So he begins questioning God. Aren't you God in heaven? And don't you rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? In other words, don't you have power to do something about these three enemy armies that are coming out against us? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and gave it to, thy, to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein and built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil comes upon us, as with the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. In other words, he's saying, this is what you told us. You said that when we were in trouble, we could come to this very place, and you'd do something about it. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou would not let Israel invade. I love this. The only reason we're dealing with these people now is because you wouldn't let us destroy them back then, Lord. You would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. I want you to notice that Jehoshaphat realized it wasn't their possession, it was God's possession. 
this land, this people belongs to you. Again, there's a challenge. Aren't you going to do something about this? Verse 12, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. We have no options. You're the only hope that we have. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Now notice that last phrase, be not afraid, because the battle is not yours, it's God. Can I ask you a question? Aren't all of our battles God's? They're supposed to be. See, I think a lot of times we read this story and we think, well, wouldn't that be great if we were in that same situation where God would tell us the battle is not ours, but it belongs to him. But folks, if the, if the Bible is accurate and the things that the Bible tells us about God's relationship with Abraham and the, the cutting of the covenant, the blood covenant that he made with Abraham, if those things are true and if those things are accurate, then all of our battles are his. In Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is still of childbearing years. He hasn't reached that 100-year mark that we know that he was or that he hit when Isaac was born. And so in Genesis chapter 15, the Lord appears to Abraham, and Abraham asks him a question. He said, what will you give me seeing I go childless? In other words, you made the promise of, of children to me, but I haven't had any. What are we going to do about that promise? Now, folks, that's a totally different situation some 15 years later when God appears to Abraham and talks to him about the child of promise and Abraham falls on his face and laughs. See, at this point in Genesis chapter 15, at that point, Abraham could still see naturally and physically concerning his age and Sarah's age and the functions of their body, they saw that that was still a possibility, or at least Abraham did. He saw that that was still a possibility. And so it's as if God wanted things to happen and transpire in such a way so that there was no physical possibility for it to take place. And the taking place I'm talking about is having the child of promise. God wanted it to be so that it was impossible other than him. And so... In answer to Abraham's question, the Lord takes him outside and shows him the sky. He said, tell me how many stars there are. And Abraham says, nobody can number the stars. And God answers him back and says, so shall your seed be. Then in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it's a very, very important scripture. Another landmark in the history of the Jews. It says, Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now the rest of the chapter tells us about the covenant that God made with him. And the covenant that they made together was that they committed their resources to one another. Now in Genesis 15, 6 where it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That verse of scripture is quoted three times throughout the New Testament. It's a very, very important event. It was a very important thing that happened because it was when God entered into the covenant with Abraham once and for all. Now that word believe in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That word believe means unqualified commitment. Unqualified commitment. Abraham, because of what God said, committed himself to the Lord without qualification, without exception, without any kind of hesitation. God's already committed himself to Abraham through his word. 
And he does so again by showing him the stars and telling him that's what his seed will be like. Or that will be as the number of the, his descendants. So he's making an unqualified commitment to the Lord. Now he's already committed to it. He's went to the land that God told him to go to. He's obeyed God and left the land of his forefathers. So he's already committed to God. But this is another step. This is a step closer on Abraham's part to God. So that God can give Abraham his best. Unqualified commitment. Now that unqualified commitment means any time that Abraham or his seed, his descendants, had need for the power of God or the delivering mercy of God or anything for, from God for that matter, that God was obligated by the covenant that he instituted. It's not like he got rooked into a bad deal. But he instituted this covenant. And this covenant is an unqualified commitment on both sides. Now that Abraham is unqualified, unqualifiedly committed, if that's a word or a proper term, I don't know. But now that Abraham is all in, God is all in with him too. So that it, when, by the time 2 Chronicles chapter 20 comes along, that is the expression of the covenant that God made. It's the, the guarantee of whatever resources God has that are necessary for Abraham's descendants. All they have to do is call upon him. And that's what they're doing. And so when the Spirit of the Lord comes on Jehaziel, son of whoever, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and says, Thus saith the Lord, the battle is not yours, it's mine. Because we're Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That means that every battle is the Lord's. That means we'll have to go out against our enemies just like Israel had to in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. But the outcome is assured. The outcome is guaranteed. God is unqualifiedly committed to you because of Abraham. That's why Jehoshaphat can stand up with such confidence and say, did not you say that when we were in trouble and we came to this place and called on your name that you'd help us? Didn't you make that promise to us? Now, folks, think about how this works. I know God doesn't slumber or sleep, but I like to imagine it this way on occasion at least. God gets up in the morning and claps his hands together and says, who do I have to defeat today? And, of course, the answer is whatever enemy is facing you. You remember one of the blessings of Abraham in Deuteronomy chapter 28, first part of the chapter. In the first 15 verses of the chapter, I believe, it says your enemy will come out against you one way and flee seven ways. That's because of God's unqualified commitment to you through the covenant that he made with Abraham. A lot of people think the Abrahamic covenant is over. It's not. It's better than it was when God made it with Abraham because we have the life of God and the righteousness of God within us and have been by that righteousness born again made a new species of being so it's a better covenant established upon better promises which simply means we've got the same promises of the old covenant plus more and of course the plus more is the relationship part the relationship side that abraham never could enter into because jesus hadn't yet been to the cross otherwise the covenant that abraham had with god is the same as what we have with him now too the only difference is Abraham was a son, or Abraham was a servant. We're children of God. So when God says, be not afraid, for the battle is not yours, you won't have to fight in it. The battle is mine, not yours. That's exactly the situation that you and I find ourselves in every day of our lives here on the earth. Whatever it looks like you have to fight, the fight's not yours. It's the Lord's. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Notice God says it doesn't matter how many of them there are. Now the number would, would uh, imply strength. So here's the scripture telling us this landmark event reveals to us the principle that it doesn't matter how big, doesn't matter how many, doesn't matter how strong, 
God is on your side. And he's big enough to take care of whatever it is. Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of his holiness. And as they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, why are they singing praises unto God? Because they believe that what God said about the battle being his. They believe they received the help of the Lord. Now, folks, I want you to realize this. It doesn't say anything about everybody feeling stronger the next day when they got up. No mention is made of how anybody feels. I'm sure, that if the, I'm sure the devil didn't take a holiday that day. I'm sure he was there whispering in people's ears just like he does every other day. I'm sure there were thoughts of doubt that were coming to people being planted in their minds by the enemy. But they set a group, Jehoshaphat set a group out front of the army. No need to put the army out front if you're not going to fight. So let's put the choir out there. Not sure how the choir felt about that. Because the circumstances haven't changed as far as they know. And it tells us what they said. And it seems pretty simple. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Folks, I don't know, and the Bible doesn't tell us one way or the other, but I don't know if the people were exuberant when they were saying praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever or if it was a sacrifice of praise because of the doubts that were going through their minds. And I think it's interesting that the Bible doesn't tell us one way or the other because it's not necessary for you to feel a certain way for it to work. It's not necessary for you to be absent of thoughts of doubt for faith to work. Faith is of the heart, not the head. And there's a lot of things that you'll see your faith bring into being or give substance to with doubt in your mind the whole time. Because it's not doubt in the mind that hinders the things of God from becoming real or coming into reality. As long as you're not speaking whatever doubts come to your mind, those thoughts of doubt aren't yours. You only take possession of them when you speak. And of course the devil's bringing them to you because he wants you to sign on. But just the presence of doubt in your mind is not enough to stop the power of God's word from working. Ever. And they began, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord said ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us that they heard a battle. The Bible doesn't tell us that Judah heard a sound from across the hillside, and it was the sound of a great army slaughtering another great army. It doesn't tell us anything about that. When they're singing their praises, they don't have any indication, physical in, indication or physical evidence that there's anything that's changed whatsoever. I'm sure they were hanging on to that promise that God made about not having to fight. But we don't have any record that there's any physical evidence that would indicate any kind of change yet whatsoever. When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord said ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. 
And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. Look how God turned things around. And their job, their only job, their only action in this whole thing is to believe what God said through the prophet and to sing and praise. They're thanking God for going out into, uh, against an enemy that outnumbers them, that is hugely more militarily advanced. And all they did is believe God and sing praises. The Bible says of Abraham when he was 100 years old concerning the, death, uh, concerning the birth of Isaac. It says Abraham was strong in faith giving glory to God. In other words, his life of praise and thanksgiving was a part of his faith coming into being. Or bringing about supernatural results. Miraculous results really. So when Abraham... It's about 99 years old and God appears to him and talks to him about the son of promise and Abraham responds to God by laughing. That would indicate that he's given up any hope of that son that God promised. So he has to go from laughing because of unbelief to a life of glorifying God for the answer before he sees it. He has to go from unbelief to strong faith and one of the ways that the Bible says that he did that, he did that in less than a year's time. And one of the ways the Bible said that he did that was he reactivated the praise of his lips. Even if it was a sacrifice of praise, it counts just the same. Look with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 beginning in verse 28 hast thou not known hast thou not heard that the everlasting God the Lord the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not neither is weary there is no searching of his understanding he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases strength even the youth shall fail and be weary and the young men shall utterly fail but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God never is on vacation, folks. He's always there. And every battle, every enemy, every fight that rises up against you is his fight, not yours. Look to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. The word dismayed means confusion or broken down. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So when you feel like you don't have enough strength, he'll strengthen you. When you feel so helpless, he'll help you. When you feel like you're going under, he'll hold you up with the right hand of his righteousness. Folks, we're not nearly as fearless as we should be. We should make it a purpose of this spirit-filled life that we live to be continually praising God and giving thanks to him. Because there's no power on earth that's greater than the one that lives on the inside of us. There is no work of the enemy that, in, that can defeat the battle that God tells every one of us is his. And every battle is his. This was not just an isolated case as far as Israel was concerned. But because it is one of those landmark events, it's a, it shows us the principle and the principle to live by is that every battle that we encounter is God's. 
And since he's on our side, we don't have to be afraid. Since he's with us, we don't have to be confused or broken down. Since he's with us, we don't have to worry about going under because he'll hold us up. So here's how it works. You remember, well, let's look together at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Here's Paul and Barnabas on their, getting ready for their first missionary journey. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. And notice the similarities between that and Second Chronicles chapter 20 when, Judah, when Jehoshaphat called all Judah together for a fast and to seek the Lord. Here, the New Testament calls it ministering to the Lord. In Jehoshaphat's case, it was just simply they fasted to find out what to do to enlist the aid of God against their enemies. But here's how it works. When we minister to the Lord, it creates an environment, just like it did in Second Chronicles chapter 20, just like it did here in Acts chapter 13. It creates an atmosphere for God to speak. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, in the same way that in the Old Testament Judah proclaimed a fast, Jehoshaphat prayed on behalf of the people. He put God in remembrance of what God had promised them, and then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. When we wait on the Lord, when we minister to the Lord, you know, so much of what we do in really ministering to the Lord, I'm talking about praise and worship, so much of the songs that we sing and the, and the songs that are everybody's favorite have more to do with how we feel about something than it does God's power and God's goodness. Ministering to the Lord is magnifying Him, not talking about ourselves. But as we minister to the Lord, Remember the scripture says that God inhabits the praises of his people. When we make praise and worship and thanksgiving a part of our lives, it brings the strength and the power and the grace of God into our lives, into our situations where God fights a battle for us and we just carry off all the stuff. I love how God turned that situation around in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Here they started off facing a combination of three enemy armies. And they wind up getting the stuff from all of the people, all, every one of the soldiers and everyone that made up the multitude that looked like it was too big for Israel. And how did God make them fight each other? How did that work? There's a couple of places in the Old Testament where it tells us certain things happened. In one place, Israel's enemies heard what, they, what sounded to them like uh, chariots, horses and chariots. And they concluded that Israel had contracted with an enemy, uh, with a, another ally to help fight against the enemy. And so they ran and started killing each other and left everything they had. It doesn't tell us what happened in this situation in Second Chronicles chapter 20. But think about that for a minute. God could use one noise and cause the enemies of Israel to run away. Not sure what happened here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It could have been a dispute between two soldiers that got out of hand and spread out through the whole camp. It could have been that God caused them to, to see one another as the Israelites instead of the armies that they were. The, the possibilities are really unlimited what God could do. Because he can make something out of nothing quicker than we can even imagine it to be done. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Folks, we serve a God that will not let us lose one battle if we'll walk in fellowship with him. 
as long as Israel, when they went into the promised land, as long as Israel obeyed what God told them to do, they did not lose one man. It was only when they disobeyed God at the city of Ai, when they disobeyed what God told Joshua to tell the people, then they started losing people in the battle. But as long as they were in fellowship and obedience to God's command, they did not lose one person. They routed their enemies and did not lose one person. We think of military endeavors now as acceptable losses. How many people dying would be considered an acceptable loss? Acceptable losses for God when he first made the covenant with the children of Israel was zero. Literally zero. And that's the God that fights our battles for us. Let's all stand and let's just lift our hands and thank God for his goodness. Thank you, Father, that the battle is not ours. It's never ours. The battle is yours. Thank you that you are well able to overcome anything and anyone that comes out against us. Thank you, Father, that your power is greater than anything the devil can do. And whereas we might look at our, our battles the circumstances and situations that we're in and think how much we would like to get away from these things, you look just the opposite. You look at ways that we can be impressed and brought to the knowledge of your goodness and your faithfulness and your strength. Father, we refuse to fear because you are our God. We refuse to be broken down or dismayed because you are with us. We thank you, Father, for helping us, for strengthening us, for holding us up with your right hand of your righteousness. We magnify you, Father. Show yourself strong in every one of our lives. Show yourself to be the God that's greater than any of the work of the enemy by the defeat of those that come out against us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for making your word so in our lives. We know it's true, and we thank you for showing it to be a reality in us. We thank you, Father. We magnify your holy name. We bless you, and we trust in you, Father. We are unqualified in our commitment. We trust you with everything, Father. And because of your great promises, we refuse to fear. We refuse to fear. But instead, we say what you said. Those enemies that come out against us one way will flee seven ways from our face. We thank you, Father, for glorifying victories. Victories that glorify the name of Jesus. We're not asking for small victories. We're asking for big ones. Big victories that show your strength and your goodness. Big victories in Jesus' name. Can you agree with that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you, folks. Thanks for being with us. Amen. I'm going to start this evening.